Oh, it's always the way. We do the countdown, and then I'll start writing the tweet going, please join the stream. And I was still writing it as this 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 came on. But this is the Open Metaverse show on the Define. I'm very pleased to be joined once again by one of the legends of the stream, the man himself, Vector Meldrew. And alongside him, Matt Mason. Today, we're going to be talking about Broadside, a decentralized tale of redacted anonymous heroes, a journey that unfolds from launch with CC0 and full commercial rights by Charlie Stratford Rex, Vector Meldrew, and Matt Mason himself. Gents, welcome to the stream. How are you? Welcome back, Vector. Thank you. Good to be back. Yeah, it's good to get into some of this stuff. I feel like ever since uh, my last show, this is completely what I've been focusing on. This Actually, me and Matt, would you believe it, have known each other for 20 years. And we've been working on this project for 10 of those years. And the last few months, we were like, now is the time to kind of get this across the finish line. Yeah, if you're on TikTok and you've been doing something for 20 years, you're basically a grandma. It's like, <laughs> I put you out to pasture, just you know, just go off to the glue factory and done. Matt, um, I hear a lot from Vector. He talks a lot. Let's let you talk. What, what is what's your story and, and what is Broadside all about? Yeah. Um so I'm getting some feedback for some reason. But um yes, I've known I've known Vector for yeah, 20 years, but I started on um, I'm going to take these off. I'm, I'm getting some crazy feedback from my headphones. Um, I started in Pirate Radio in, in London um, with like sort of the early garage scene and grime scene and dubstep scene and was founding editor of a, a magazine called Rewind. And that's where I met Vector. Rewind was, it started, it was four of us in the back of a record shop um, in South London we grew it into one of the largest music platforms and, and music magazines in the UK. But it was super early on. It was like a couple months into the magazine that um, this 16 year old kid walks in who's been designing flyers for the So Solid crew. And he tells us he's just been fired from his job uh, collecting beer glasses at a dog racing track for setting fire to a dustbin and stealing peanuts. But he thinks he can design us a really great website. And that kid was Vector Meldrew, and he grew that website into one of the largest, largest um, music music websites in the world at the time. We we went on to do some amazing things together. We've written TV shows together that aired all over Europe, um, and we've just been like you know really good mates for a long, a long, long time. Your story is kind of interesting as well because you were you were involved at BitTorrent when. BitTorrent kind of went legit because Bit BitTorrent had a, a terrible reputation at one point because it was just a place where you just got pirated music and then they they went down this bundles route. Yeah. In many ways they were kind of ahead of ahead of their time. And but you were deeply involved in all of that. What what was what was going on there? Yeah, I was um I was involved at BitTorrent. So after after Rewind, I wrote a book called The Pirates Dilemma about kind of like what's the um how does piracy work as a um as a something that you can use as a strategy um sorry my headphones, i'm just gonna turn this off maybe it's use the normal mm. mic we're live this is what happens live this is what happens live we, we have a, a professional human being who is deeply connected with the world of music and recording technology and uh and he's failed us I would, I'm a semi-professional human. Being. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is what happens. Um, at least we're live. So, so you were talking about BitTorrent and the story. Yeah, so uh, I, I wrote this book called The Pirate's Dilemma about sort of piracy as a strategy and it's better to compete with piracy versus fight pirates. And we gave the book away free and it was a bestseller in 10 countries. And um, it, it just sort of opened a lot of doors and I was touring with it and... Um, I was I was speaking at Cannes and I met the um, CEO of BitTorrent and I was like, wait, what? BitTorrent's got a CEO? I thought it was like a protocol. I thought it was like a, I thought it was like ISIS, you know. Um, and he's like, no, we've got a hundred million users and we don't really know what to do with them. And I'm sure they we know they buy loads of content, but how do we can we can we use it as a force for good? And I was just like, oh my god, this is this is the biggest pirate radio station in the world. I know exactly what to do with this. And so ended up moving to San Francisco, becoming the head of marketing and the chief content officer of BitTorrent. We grew the audience to 175 million people and we started this 
platform within the BitTorrent ecosystem called Bundles, launched it with Tom York from Radiohead, the first sort of pay for ever torrent file, which was um, an artificially scarce torrent file. So you could only download it a certain number of times. It definitely was not an NFT, but we were really thinking about scarcity of digital goods and like, how do you do that in an ecosystem that's decentralized? Like very early on, this is like 2012, we really started on that. Um, so I've just been really deep in that. And then more after BitTorrent, I was around an innovation lab for Sony Pictures, but it really, it really started to just become very obvious to me that crypto was the killer app and crypto was the thing that was going to unlock decentralized culture. Like it's been my mission since pirate radio to, to figure out how do we scale this culture so that kids can just do things, go from naught to 60, whether it's music or film or storytelling, like how do you create platforms that let people do that and crypto and being able to do microtransactions super fast was obviously the thing. So I ended up becoming CMO at Kraken, um, helping them scale their marketing team. And then after Kraken started to get into NFTs quite seriously, um, first with Warps and then and now with Palm NFT Studio and and working with Vector on Broadside. Yeah, Palm Palm is an interesting one because they're they're very, very niche, but quite legit in many ways. Um I remember the currency when it came out was a huge thing. And it, uh, Damien Hurst had done 10,000, just random. He'd done a PFP project before they were even a thing. And they just, he'd actually yeah. painted, like 2016, he'd made them. And then somebody was like, oh, well, let's just do them as NFTs. I was watching the countdown um, in July, I think it was, you know, the countdown to whether you could redeem for the physical or not. And it ended up like 50 50 parity, like 50% of people wanted the physical item, 50% wanted the NFT, which was shocking. I thought most people would keep the NFT, to be honest with you. So, real art people yeah. has it has a place. Um, so, that brings you to where we are now. I just wanted to kind of rewind to something that, that stood out in your resume here. You were once named best pirate by Bloomberg Business Week. That is correct. And you were talking about how it's not good to fight pirates. I, I, I would, I could see myself in another life strapping on some leather boots and you know, with a cutlass and just going fighting pirates. I think that's a very honorable profession. So, you know, <laughs> yeah, being a privateer, I think is the greatest, that's the, that's the right middle ground, right? Like a, a, a pirate, but you're figuring out how to do it legit. That's, that's, that's exactly. The, well, I'm, I'm kind of being glib, but the, the, the feeling in cryptocurrency is that we are all pirates to a degree and that yeah. we're all we're all skirting around the boundaries of what's legal and right and possible but in some ways that has to stop at a certain point and i guess this is the challenge that you faced with BitTorrent: is how to take the spirit of that community and and turn it into something positive without losing the spirit of that community and it's so yeah. interesting that you you were hanging around the grime scene because i remember very vividly when that grew up and it felt like for about two three years the most exciting thing that was going on and then it stopped yeah. <laughs> and like they were all over tv they were massively overexposed and then it stopped and it was just kind of weird and I, I look back on that sort of weirdly fondly and i keep finding myself you know listening to old grime tracks and and dubstep tracks and thinking, what, what happened to all those kids you know yeah it was like it's a punk, right? It was the same thing. Like punk was like very, very short period in time. It just sort of exploded and then imploded. And Grime had the, a similar, a similar kind of first life. But then Grime had this reincarnation that's get to lead and and it's now become, you know, it is it is still there. And I think that's sort of what happens to a lot of these cultures. Like you look at them and they they explode and then they sort of go away. Like garage is still there, drum and bass is still there, dubstep's obviously took on a, a whole other mutation, but yeah, it's really, it's really interesting how these things sort of mutate. So I'm going to not let Vector speak because we're going to show the trailer for Broadside and then I'll let him speak. Um, but yeah, this is, this is a little glimpse of what Broadside could be, might be. It's a little bit spooky, a little bit weird, a little bit glitchy. Let's take a look. <laughs> Oh, my God. 
kind of feel a bit like the guys like didn't read there i have no idea what's going on but i but if i can love it but if i can love it so tell me what what is going on vector mode well sure. this this is a common theme people do look at it and like i don't know what's going on but i love it this this is our most common piece of feedback so far um but the the simplest way to explain it is uh, these, you know, this is a project we've been developing for 10 years. We've adapted it to where we are, where we are now in terms of the way the metaverse is scaling and different, different issues that might be occurring now, internet issues in terms of like, uh, centralization versus decentralization, abundance versus scarcity. But we show a future vision for how these things have real world implications. Uh, but it's, you know, we're starting with a story. So this is a uh, action sci-fi solar punk theme story um whereby you know there's so many things you can do and you, with uh, all these different projects different nft projects that are cropping up but we just wanted to start things kind of bare bones start with a story start with the art and then go from there so this this is something that's basically you know ready to go from launch as soon as this is minted the story begins each person has their own hero and they take part in the story in a decentralized fashion or a decentralized experience because each each hero or each character has their own unique name and unique um you know image through which is the lens to read this story so everyone has a similar experience but um a collective experience which ends up being a way to kind of show a decentralized experience so it starts with minting a, a broadsider and then there's going to be 11 episode NFTs, which will tell the story of your specific character. And you say that this has already been written. I'm so curious about this. Yeah. And there's going to be new art for each episode. And then a whole bunch of other hidden Easter egg kind of things that will be airdropped or sent as rewards for things. And then at the end, you can take those chapters, burn them for a single kind of comp compilation of everything. And a whole bunch more physical copies i guess mm -hmm. so you've, you've sent me the blurb about the story so this is this is what i've got the story follows your character an anonymous hero known only to you who hacks a game called broadside in a future world where everything is very locked down and centralized and hacking on money and thing is illegal all right so there's a there's a background story here it's solar punk we'll get back into that as well a little bit um, what is this character going to do and how do they progress through the story? Yeah, I can, I can say that better if you want. Um, so there's, uh, the story is about, uh, this kid who's obsessed with a game called Broadside. So Broadside is a, is a play to earn AR game that people play in the real world. It's like Halo, but you play it outside and you have armor and you have NFT weapons and ammo, uh, and everything's really locked down. I mean, this is one thing about NFTs that we don't we don't talk about to your point earlier, like piracy versus privateers. You can use Web3 for ways to lock things down and ways to make things more more interesting. In the game, everything's locked down. In the world, everything's locked down. Um, so um, when you say locked down, how do you mean exactly? It, it's like it's controlled or it's, it's like a one giant company closed loop system. Oh, right. It yep. owns broadside. It owns all the 3D printers that make all the stuff. It owns the vitro vats that grow all the food. So all the problems of like copying and abundance on the internet have kind of scaled into the real world. And, and that company's called Amazon. Sorry, no, it's called Proto. The company's called, Amazon. Um, <laughs> the company's called Proto, um, and this kid just wants to make broadside a little bit better and this kid knows how to fix 3d printers because they have a job fixing 3d printers after school 
they get into the code in broadside just to make this one little change to make a slightly better version of the game for them and their friends and that little change that they make that little hack ends up being a key that can unlock any 3d printer in the world so something like pandora's box opens you can use any 3d printer to suddenly print weapons or ammo and the world just unlocks and this world that's supposed to be very very locked and you as the hero are then forced into this journey where you're on the run and you're an outlaw from this company trying to get you and you're forced to think about the pros and cons of decentralization of abundance versus scarcity of all this different stuff with this shadowy resistance movement that wants to overthrow proto and then you're also thinking you're this you're this struggling kid and you're like well i just want to get money i don't care about all this stuff like that's how you sort of start in the journey um and the fun thing about it was the way we wrote broadside it was always this is about a group of of kids who come together this loose knit mesh network to fight something that they all believe in but no one really ever knows who the hero is they're always being misgendered and misidentified so it just made so much sense like let's create let's let's start this as a, a group of characters and you're all playing the character you all think you're the main character but nobody really knows who the main character is except you the broadside holder because you're reading your version of the story so we wanted to do this in a way that it was always decentralized right from the start and it was sort of, we were always for a long time this was just a project we had like we were kicking it around and trying to pitch it as a you know dreamworks had it in development as a movie and penguin had it as a book but like, no no but it has to be decentralized and everyone's like what are you talking you know this is like over 10 years we like, what what are you guys talking about it doesn't even make any sense so we just sort of put it in a drawer like we've always had lots of other things going on and thought we'll we'll, we'll just do broadside when when we can or never and then when nfts hit vector and i just like, oh shit like it's it's time to do broadside this is perfect it's 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 a pfp project but not for the sake of it we've always wanted to do this and we finally can so you say it's not a pfp project in what way does it differ from a pfp project it's it's 100 a pfp project um <laughs> it's so it's a pfp project but um we, I guess what I mean is we'd imagined we wanted to do a PFP project and we there was no way to do one. We didn't know what it was. But what we really wanted to do was give everybody the main character. Yeah. And so here's, here's your character. Here's your rights to the character. Here's the story. Here's the world, the sandbox. Go and play in this world or make your own sandbox. But let's grow a franchise. Let's do decentralized Star Wars or pick your pick your franchise. Let's just do something crazy. But everybody gets the rights and this is the sort of the piracy element like how do you scale culture how do you give people building blocks yeah this is this is the bit that gets me excited about you guys and your your background because pirate culture and like i i, I kind of got exposed to it through rave culture and my, my best mate was a rave mc and and we used to talk about like being a, a jungle mc in like 92 93 and you just try and wrap your head around what that would have been like and mm -hmm. and like this wouldn't happen now everything's too easy it's too easy to find the party it's too easy to get things but like you had to work to find shit you had to really put the effort in to get the record to get that you know that one pressing of a of a of a, mm. of a tune and then get it to the party in one piece like all of these things that that feels like that feels really human and kind of yeah. exciting and dangerous and all these other things that like just is it's everything I love about crypto. And if we sanitize it and make everything too easy and too convenient, it, it, all, it all goes away, which is again, why I think when people say, oh, we should abstract away all the difficult things about setting up a wallet and, and hosting your own private keys. Like why? If you want to reignite the survivor instinct in people, you need to make shit hard for them. Not easier. Mm -hmm. I don't know. That's, that's just my, my feeling. Yeah. But that, that kind of, you know, piles into this scarcity versus abundance thing, because what you're putting, in here is that it's the replicator in in star trek isn't it like yeah. that machine can make you anything you want therefore scarcity goes away therefore nobody has any leverage anymore because there's there's not artificial scarcity in the world but nfts by their very nature are artificially scarce so it's it's a it's a nice little kind of tension in there and i'm curious how you're going to resolve it 
Yeah, we wanted to do a project that was absolutely using the building blocks of Web3. And I love what, I love what you just said. Like, you're so right. Like, culture was always, is always fun when it's hard and it's not always immediately accessible to everyone. And, and I think Web3 is really benefiting from that right now. And it, and it will get easier and it will get more accessible. But the, the crypto art and the culture, I think, we're seeing that trend the other way, right? Like, you know, wag die and all these projects where there's just like, it's really actually really difficult to actually go and get one of these NFTs. Um, but yeah, I mean, with, with Broadside, we didn't want to, we didn't want to kind of sugarcoat this and be like, yeah, like everything in Web3 is great, wag me. It's like, no, like technology is a tool and you can use it for good things and bad things. And here's how you can use NFTs in a way that's super oppressive and web three and here's how you can break that and it's up to you which side which side this debate or where on that spectrum you fall on but we wanted to create a cast of characters so that you as the hero going through it get to talk to all of those characters and understand all of their perspectives um and the the, the character definitely follows a you know a path through the story but we didn't want to sort of sugarcoat sugarcoat everything or make something that everybody's you know this is the right way to think about this yeah i i i'm curious if you can give me a sense of what it's going to be like if you if you own one of these nfts what's the journey going to be like what's the experience going to be like and how does it unfold as mm. a piece of narrative yeah i mean well look, i want to turn it over to vector because he's he's definitely not saying enough but um I think in terms of the way Vector approached all the art, I'm really glad you brought up like old like rave culture and like 92 stuff because we really, Vector and I both sort of grew up in that era too, like kids listening to pirate radio, sort of jungle and everything before the grind scene and everything where we just like to get involved. But like obs just obsessed with early flyers, like old Dreamscape flyers and Fantasia and artists like Pez and really we were sort of thinking about how does that connect to this solar punk thing and this vision of the future and 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 vector really sort of took took the culture element of of sort of the rave scene and and really translated it into something that feels super new to me mm. yeah i feel like we were we were incredibly aligned in that in that kind of ethos pretty much because we started from the same place having the same interests in the back of that record shop with, uh, you know, working for a music magazine and and getting that off the ground. So I, I feel like the concepts that Matt writes about, I just intuitively understand them. And, and I always have appreciated his storytelling abilities um, and just bringing that to life visually. So, you know, there's different uh, areas within this world that's been developed. Like he's already touched on the game element. You know, we're strong, we're strong gamers. We both used to nerd out um, over some of the early Grand Theft Auto games. So the way that Grand Theft Auto lore gets so deep in that story world, we're definitely inspired by that. There's, you know, the rave culture element he touched on that, you know, the the story or the world has its own future music scene, which, you know, is rooted in the bass music that we both uh, bonded over. But we've created a, a future vision of that bass music and what that means uh, it's, it's under the, the term 3D base, but what that means and what that stands for in this future world. Because again, there's all these different things that might not on the surface don't look like they align, but to us, we, we and probably to your, your, yourself as well, Robin, you, you might see the common thread through things like certain computer games, rave culture, pirate culture, remix culture, crypto. There's, there's something in all of those uh, which we feel connects really strongly and leads to quite like a deep a deep story so th all these things um and and the way it's tied together with a music that kind of bonds it as a culture in the future in the, in this year 2037 all these things are kind of tied together together under this same banner so i think when people see it they can see the potential of uh, where we want to take this story in, in all those different areas, you know, the music area, the gaming area, um, the cinematic action, science fiction type area that we've explored. Um, so the, we really feel like, you know, back to your point about what the experience will be. We, we're really trying to um, make it quite an all-encompassing experience, in, experience uh, that draws on all these different experiences and interests we have and kind of shows how they tie together and shows how that affects uh, you know, 
a future vision for our space. But again, like Matt says, not not in a, a black and white way. Not like saying, uh, you know, it has it, the, the book actually has emphasis on some of the shades of grey between the uh, between these different subjects. Not saying one thing is good and one thing is bad, but just painting a full picture for people to immerse themselves in with these different touch points, essentially. Yeah. So, is it going to be? puzzles on in discord is it going to be animations is it going to be comic book strips how what do we what do we get exactly so yeah we get so you start you, you start the journey um there's an interesting sort of piece we're doing with the forward um which will sort of unfold just before the launch um but then once it's launched you'll be able to mint a broadsider and the the launch day i think is the first the first point when we're going to start, we really want to spark a debate um, and see what people do with these different broadsiders. So we've created one collection of broadsiders, but within that collection, there's actually two different two different types of rights that you can get. So we work with a lot of CC artists, CC zero artists like Xcopy and Eclectic Method, um, and we we use a lot of CC zero art from from big projects that we love, like Cryptodes and Goblin Town and Moonbirds um work with a bunch of artists directly and got their blessing um like x copy and that's method and christy glass and so some broadsiders have different like they've got cc0 war paint you might have a moonbird painted on your helmet or a right click save as guy t-shirt or a sticker of a cryptode on your helmet if you've got any cc0 elements on your broadsider that broadsider is a cc0 broadsider and you or anyone else can do whatever you like with it um, on any platform you wish. It's completely CC0 and public domain. If your broadsider doesn't have any CC0 elements, you, you as the holder have full commercial rights to that broadsider. So we wanted to really explore because we, you know, we've been part of this debate. We're, we're obsessed with copyright and IP and how do you do things differently in Web3. And we love what's going on with CC0. And also we have so many projects where they just give you the full commercial rights in a in a more defined way. And I, I guess it sort of harks back to, for me at least, the pirate's dilemma. Like, it's a choice. There's not really a right answer here, but you should go think about it. So we thought, well, if we do one collection and we do CC zeros and full commercial rights, it's going to be really interesting to see what people do with both of those different models. And it, it was it's crazy. Like, even before we've got started, Eclectic Method is adding a CC zero broadsider to a new fighting game that he's building. So like the CC zeros have already got a head start. They're already in a game before the trailers come out, um, which is pretty crazy. And then, you know, so when, when we go with the full commercial rights, I can't wait to see what people do with those along the journey. So you're going to get your broadsider. People will start doing things with them. Every couple of weeks, we're going to be dropping each broadsider uh, an episode and that episode will be, will read as a book so like a chapter from a book with unique cover art that's about your broadsider so if your broadsider is called robin you're reading a story about robin and everyone else is reading a different story about their broadsider so you'll get these chapter nfts they'll be dropped on a on a on a very regular basis there's other artifacts from the world that we're going to introduce that will take people down rabbit holes and, and be puzzles that you know some things will happen in real life some things will happen in web 2 and some will happen in web 3 just to kind of mess with people along the way and sort of take the story in different directions um and then at the end of this journey you'll get to merge and burn these episodes if you have every episode along the way if you've actually gone to get every episode you'll be able to merge and burn them into a full book nft with your broadsider on the cover which is the story is all about robin the broadside is the hero and then you'll be able to print physical copies. We'll give you the EPUB files. You'll be able to do whatever you like with those. We're releasing the story under a different Creative Commons license, um, a CC4 license, which is lets you do things with it commercially and non-commercially. But we're going to set up and make it very easy for you to sell copies of your book. So you can sell Robin, uh, the Robin edition of Broadside. Um, through Amazon, uh, speaking of our favorite centralized company, hopefully with the same ISDN number. And the idea there is that if 
if thousands of broadsiders all have their own versions of the book that they can sell um and and we do that all at once we can potentially hack the new york times bestseller list with a crazy pfp project about decentralization oh i love that they yeah, keep saying that's, it's a pyramid scheme let's fucking give them a pyramid scheme. fuck yes uh, i mean th this is the stuff that that, that gets me moist I, I, honestly when when you're taking something that is fundamentally should be right on the fringes and you just thrust it straight into the bleeding heart i love that shit it's it's the it is it's the it's the culture of pirates and, yeah. and, and like you know tearing things up but also doing it in a really structured and meaningful way so it's not just pure anarchy very cool i i thought we were going to be joined by another person on the stream and the th funny thing about this is that there is there is another human attached to this project mm -hmm. but i've never seen you guys together i'm talking about the elusive mr stratford rex where is charlie and why he's, hard, he's very hard to find we think he might be living in a cabin in the woods at the moment uh but he he occasionally pops up to do pipe radio type live streams so we, he does have an internet connection um but yeah i think he's he's in a place where maybe he's rejecting some of the modern day technology and, well, I, uh, I, heard, I heard he was he, he got a, a job in the mousetrap in london <laughs> west end and he's just he's just treading the boards every day so because that, that's the last place anyone would think to look for him that's all kind of rumors no one knows no one knows who, he could be any one of us it could be you robin I've there's, there's 92.7 fm this is mm -hmm. a nameless pirate radio station that charlie dj's on but like yeah. where is charlie who is charlie is he even is he english is he jamaican like where is he from is it actually a man it could be a woman yeah, he's only like, really he's like, 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 who who is this? Who is this child? You guys know, you must know. We hear him, he comes on, he goes on 97, 92.7 FM, um, this nameless pirate radio station, and he and he's been just DJing and playing 3D bass and dropping alpha about the project to people. Um, he tells us he's gonna be doing that, you know, every single week. How does he tell you? Does he like leave little notes in in the in the phone box? Little notes through the phone box, brick through the window. That's right. Bag of dog poop on fire with a post-it note on it. He's <laughs> he's very analog in how he communicates. It's it's, it's the M twenty five auto man. You just go up there, second petrol station on the left. That's it. It's there, it's behind the girls' toilets. That's exactly where it is. Oh man. Yeah. <laughs> and what happens if you play his records backwards? Oh my god! I've you never. Get private key. <laughs> Yeah. The, the, the people in the chat are going to start doing that now. You know, you've said that. Of course they are. Of course they are. <laughs> this is all. This is all old school puzzle behavior. I mean, if you if you came to our last uh, launch party, allow list rave in Decentraland, you would have seen Charlie DJing. Uh, you know, he's a very very energetic uh, DJ, park radio style. So it's, it gives on a good performance, and he plays all the kind of classic 3D bass music. Classic. I mean, we we all have our fond memories of 3D bass. Um, <laughs> I think there was a mashup of Master Chef, where it's uh, it's the fat bald one talking bass, 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 buttery biscuit, biscuit bass. bass. Yeah, like, similar. They did, a, they did a 3D remix of that, and it was it was fat as my mama's butt. <laughs> similar. similar. <laughs> <laughs> That's what started it. Actually, it was it was Eamon Holmes. Eamon Holmes. Well, yeah, how, he's the, he's, how did that come into all of this? Isn't he the chef that did that? No, he's not the chef. He's the smooth-talking Irishman who's like, "Good morning." Ainsley Harriet. Ainsley Harriet. Ainsley yeah. Harriet. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, nice. he, that was ready, steady twat. Similar. Yeah. Similar. <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyway, none of them as strong as all of us, and that's the truth. That's right. That's absolutely the truth. So this this tickles a lot of buttons. I mean, I'm wondering if people who are not into the rave scene, rave culture will pick up on the jokes, but I think it's such a good analog for crypto culture in general, the way we just find clues in Telegram and rough, rough as tits Telegram channels and Discord, like, you know, scratching around in the dirt for, for clues. Um, feels very, feels very apt. Um, so after you've burned or not burned your 11 chapters, what happens next? Season two? Yeah, season two, and we're not we're, we're we're very focused on season one, and we we're not you know we're still thinking about season two, and I think 
we want to see what happens with season one and what people do um, t- before we make a lot of decisions. But yeah, look, we're, we're really designing broadside so it can plug into a, a, a lot of different ways to extend the story and, and, and different platforms. And, you know, both Vector and I, in, in the other work we've been doing in, in Web3 and NFTs, have been ex- getting to experiment and, and think a lot and work with a bunch of different brands and IPs and stories and platforms and auction houses and artists. And, and so, yeah, we've got this crazy sort of map of string, string and pins in terms of these are all the ways broadside could go, but sort of want to see, oh, what does the community start doing with this? And then, and then like, let's go, let's go where they're going and, and, and keep sort of building in a way that, that, that elevates everything that everyone else is doing with the characters. I mean, it must be funny for you because you've shepherded this project through all the different stages of grief when it comes to trying to get it produced. And mm. now suddenly, like, it's hard when you come up with a project and you know the ending and you, you've built the shape of it and you can go and pitch it mm. in 60 seconds to suddenly have this open-ended version of it that isn't really open-ended, but it's also got this open-ended component to it. How ready are you to let go of your IP? Or are you still kind of, you know, a benevolent dictator on, on top of it all i think it's been built in that way since the start i think that was always the problem that we we had when we were pitching it through the conventional routes as matt was saying wanting it to be decentralized in some kind of fashion but the, the platform or whatever not being quite right for it um so i you know i think that's that i know for a fact uh you know matt and charlie have both been thinking about these things since um you know for for decades now i mean the one of the reasons uh, actually i understood bitcoin a bit more in 2013 was because i'd i'd read broadsides and i understood the concept of decentralization a bit better so i feel like yeah it's it's ingrained in that it, it's it's suited towards nfts as a platform and as a media distribution format um so where it goes we you know we there are outlines for season 2 season 3 various other verticals but it's it's definitely about you know seeing where this first phase goes starting with the story as we're saying and taking it from there and all those different pins and the, those different uh pieces of string on our board of where things could go figuring it out um organically mm-hmm. and with the community and based on sentiment well we've got a question here from devrox it's a slightly mm-hmm. baffling question is this on palm or mainnet um Palm is a is a it, it is a main net. I think you mean Ethereum. Like Palm is is its own network and it, it has a. It's it's, a it's on ETH main net. Yeah. Oh, it's on ETH. It's on ETH. Two. Ethereum. It's two point oh. Yeah. Um, that's good. What? Why? Why not on Palm? Is there any particular reason for that? It's it's not it's not really um, this is you know this is Palm is very much focused on uh, existing IP. And really good for that. I think this is very new. This is this is very much like an ETH Web three independent IP type project uh, that's you know kind of you know independent creators. So it's it's a different kind it's of thing. The it's where the audience is in there. And I think when I have a lot of people showing me Solano at the moment and talking about how kind of more advanced it is and how great the community is, and and I, I honestly have no bandwidth to to take a look. But I'm sure it's the case, like the XTZ and then the Henny th- thing. But like, yeah, if you like the people that I know are everyone's on Ethereum for better or for worse. Mm. So, you know, I got, yeah, like I, I can, I have to say something in Tom's defense. Um, but like, um, you're absolutely right. Like, this is the audience for this project. It's such a sort of, it's such a sort of focused project on decentralization, very targeted at, Dgens who are all on mainnet Ethereum, and it didn't make sense to do broadside anywhere else except on mainnet. You know, as we go and think about different things we're going to do in terms of airdrops and free mints and some of the larger pieces of the puzzle that will come out, we're looking at a number of different L2s and side chains as solutions for that. Um, but the, the thing with Palm is, and I obviously as being part of the Palm NFT Studio team, I have a like, good understanding of this is we're being very deliberately slow with how we launch the palm network and roll it out um like the palm foundation is getting stood up it's a very separate thing from palm nft studio so we the company that started the palm nft studio 
our only it was us henny candy consensus a few others that started the palm network we've been very 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 sort of slow and deliberate about how that's rolling out there's been no airdrop um or you know anything like anything sort of assigning value to the token because long term we think that makes the most sense for large companies who are going to bring lots and lots of users into the space um and it's just a completely different i think over time it's going to like if we were doing broadside in five or ten years time i don't think there's i don't think we'd do it on mainnet necessarily because the gas fees and the congestion is going to be so high that probably everything's going to move to l2s um roll-ups and side chains like that's the way ethereum's been built but right now the action is on is on mainnet for a project like broadside and we want people to be so experimental and and that really was the right thing for it but you know i, I would love to do broadside drops on palm you know, as it made sense on an ongoing basis for sure so we have i uh, we should probably name check the artists that are kind of featured here so we've got x copy rect guy moonbirds goblin town nouns blip maps christy glass cryptodes eclectic method grills gang robness max osiris and more um <laughs> how, how how did you go about doing that that's a lot of conversations and a lot of prodding to make something like that happen it really is it really is i mean but this is also partly the beauty of cc0 so you know a lot of those projects are open for people to use um obviously there's still an element of because i'm an artist and, and i speak to these artists every day i still feel like i need to get their their blessing and their permission for using certain things so um you know famously x copy for instance went full cc zero about a month or so ago now and it, it raised a big debate but we were talking about using cc zero art before that so uh, so i would like message him but like hey you know i love jpeg summer I think it'd be perfect on this thing. Can I use it? And he's like, yeah, sure. And I was like, oh, okay, it was quite straightforward. And and then I'd even send him stuff and I'd be like, you know, am I going too far with this? Like I'm kind of using it on a full helmet. And he's, he was just like, nah, far is good. Like go for it. So it, it, was, it was honestly quite easy and quite surprising. But then obviously, you know, he just went full CC zero of everything, made it all official, probably about a month after. Um, and, that, and that's, you know, sparks, an amazing debate within the nft community and some people are like oh it's the end of artists uh you know rights and royalties and etc but i think it's just a testament for how um you know certain artists being cc0 friendly and the way that they can then be their work can be used on certain projects um can play into another level of creativity and another le level of rarity because i haven't seen a collection that's uh utilized this in a way like we say we've split the rights between work that has cc0 on being cc0 uh, rights for the holders and full commercial rights for the holders so there's a, a next kind of experimentation that will show things and in terms of how the market responds to that level of of uh, rarity and and rights so uh, also i would i would note that we wanted to do this conceptually as well it's not just about uh using these artists work for the sake of using their artwork on, on a piece we're, we're also saying in the story that uh the reasons for these choices in copyright and how that plays into the narrative uh you know the, these these kids are basically pulling up famous relics from the past like artistic relics from our periods that we're creating now but they're in the year 2037 and they're you know they referenced rob ness or they'll reference trasher or they'll reference x copy as a historic thing that then sits in uh you know places like the louvre you know, as, um, yeah, you know, a statement piece in the same way the Mona Lisa would be. So we we wanted to make it native to crypto art culture. We wanted to pay respects to crypto art culture and be like, hey, in the future, this vision we're creating of the future, crypto art culture has a place in a wider cultural movement. And the artists that were CC0 friendly have accelerated like to, to the point where they're like staples in uh the broader culture of what these kids are creating well <laughs> <laughs> i've just been reminded that i didn't do the sponsors messages and to the sponsors i do apologize it's time to do the sponsors messages we'll be right back 
after this. Do you think that Bitcoin will be higher than $20,000 in the next 30 days? Bet on it on Logium.org, the first P2P DeFi betting protocol. Go to app.logium.org, connect your wallet, choose the token that you want to bet on, make a bet that interests you from the list, click Take Bet button, and done. You can track your earnings on the portfolio page, and it's so simple. Take your first bet on Logium. Galaxy is the leading Web3 credential data network in the world. This collaborative credential infrastructure enables brands and developers to engage communities and build robust products in Web3. With Galaxy, users can explore Web3 and learn to earn campaigns with over 700 partners. On the other hand, builders have the opportunity to create growth campaigns on a seamless plug-and-play dashboard. Galaxy is constantly innovating, introducing Galaxy Passport, the one-click solution to verifying Web3 identities. Mint yours today. Yeah, fun thing about sponsors is you, we, we need them to pay for the channel. I mean, it, it's, mm -hmm. it's one of those kind of deeply difficult things um, that we have to juggle. There's where to put the sponsors, when to put the sponsors in. Uh, it's fun times. I found my sound effects panel and in kind of celebration of pirate culture... <laughs> That's a sound. Yeah. A lot of memories, right? Like yeah. just Tim Westwood. Tim Westwood. <laughs> oh, you had to go there, right? Did, did he get cancelled? He got cancelled. Yeah, right? he did. He's he in hot water. Did. He's in trouble. Oh, I never know. liked. There's something about his shoulders, right? He was just, just like this, just really kind of awkward. He used to yeah, write Tim for Westwood. Yo, <laughs> he used to write for us at Rewind. He was a really nice bloke. I think I got cancelled. Yeah, he got. Also, Matt, if you remember. We made a TV series for Channel U, and the reason we didn't get a second series was actually because they they hired Tim Westwood to do a show. Do you remember that? Oh, uh, so Tim Westwood cancelled us. Tim Tim Westwood cancelled us, and now who's getting cancelled? Yeah, it's. I mean, he's been the voice of hip hop on the BBC for so long, and a uh, strange voice, strange kind of representative for all that stuff. But yeah, he got cancelled. Yeah, it happened. Yeah. So I, I wanted to kind of quiz you guys on more of a kind of general feeling around NFTs and in, in general, because <clears throat> I mean we are we are where we are sentimentally, and I keep reading people saying, "Well, NFTs are dead, so what's next? Uh, you know, what's the new narrative? What's the new shiny thing?" I'm like, "Dude, like NFTs are not dead. Like <laughs> idiots have gone away, but like." I don't feel like NFTs are dead. I don't feel like the source is gone away. I feel like there's so much left to say in this space, but I'm curious what you guys think. If they're dead or not. <laughs> well, I'm not dead. Are you dead? I mean, you're you're a blue alien with boggly eyes. You must be in some way dead. Avatars never die. Avatars but I mean, I, I honestly feel quite good about uh, the trajectory and where things are going. I, I feel... Uh, the, the sentiment is obviously a bit all over the place in terms of what different people think, but uh, creatively, it's just been amazing to just focus without too much noise. It, it feels a bit more like uh, people that are around are quite serious now, so you can have a conversation whereby people are more open to discussing certain things because it was the, the amount of inbound requests that were happening you know, in that really busy period market-wise was just insane. Just people coming out of the woodwork and asking for things. And I think everyone suffered from this because it was such a hot space. It just feels, it feels more pleasant now and it feels, it mm. feels um, more relaxed. Obviously there's, you know, headwinds against us, all kinds of macro or crypto market type stuff, but we, we're not really too focused on that. We're honestly just really happy to be getting this project out. And we, we actually feel like now is a, better time to be releasing this project because you know we, we want to tell a story this this is this is the meta that people discuss is storytelling nfts we want to tell a story and i feel like if you want to tell people a story they need to be calm they need to be in the right place because you know this is a journey it's going to take a few months and, and we want people to to be in the right headspace for it i don't think last year was quite the right headspace for a story of this nature to be honest yeah <clears throat> and i i'm going to put this one to you man what what is your definition of story? That's a really great question. Um, I think it's like the story is absolutely fundamental to the human condition, right? Like Bitcoin is a story. Religion is a story. Like a shared fiction is absolutely the reason that we're different from all other animals. It's because all of us can, a group of us can believe in something together in a way that like sapiens 
is all about this, right? That book, Yuval Hariri, like, yeah. that's what's different about us. That's why we evolved and other, like, that's why we have cities and technology is because we can explain something to other people and they can imagine it and all get behind it. So like, I think story is, is fundamental to the human condition, but this is also the thing that I think has been missing. Like for me, like, you know, our NFT is dead. Like, I don't know, like I was a bit torrent when decentralized technology was dead. I was at Kraken when crypto was dead. Like I'm used to building when, when everyone's saying things are dead. And then, you know, next thing you know, oh my God, like, you know, these things have just scaled beyond anyone's wildest imagination. Like, that happened with Dub Dubstep was 50 of us in one club on a Monday night on Oxford Street. And then like 10 years later, it's Skrillex on a billboard in Vegas. Like nobody in the club in London knew that Skrillex on the billboard was coming. And I think this is the sort of condition like that, that we've grown up with with Pirate Radio is if you create building blocks and they're good enough and the story around them is strong enough and the culture around them is strong enough, it will go. And it doesn't matter if you're not in control of the direction it goes in, you're going to create something great. And I think the people, everyone I know building in Web3 right now is making building blocks like that. And everyone is like, NFTs are dead because my bags are on fire. So, all right, well, that, that's fine. And I'm sorry your bags are on fire. Mine are on fire too. But that's not the point. Like the, and I think the thing we haven't done well collectively in Web3 yet is show people or involve people in, no, this isn't just a JPEG. Like, this is a new way to tell a story. Like someone asked in the chat, is music a big part of this? The way that music, the way that culture, the way that fashion, the way that all these different dimensions unfold in broadside and let the user then take those and do other things with them. Like, these are the, we wanted to do this because we felt that this needed to be done in Web3. Like, we, we're so excited about, we've been trying to tell a story for 10 years, we just didn't have the tools. And a similar thing with Warps, like, Warps is an amazing project, but behind it is this AI music engine. And it was like, well, what, what do we do with this generative music? Like, where do you do it? There's all these projects plugging into Web3 now because it just, we've never had a tool set quite like this for just decentralizing culture at scale um, and, and, and letting other people go and play with things. So I'm really excited to see, well, I, I love it. I love it being dead right now because it means we get to do things like this and, and put these building blocks out there. Yeah, you, you talked about the new the new tools coming out. We've got Stable Diffusion and Mid Journey and Dali, and the things that are possible with those tools now are frankly astonishing. Yeah, but they are not story. They are like the lens I put on my camera. They are yeah. like a pen. The mm -hmm. story doesn't write itself yet, and if it does then you'll know that it's written by the hand of an AI and it's valid as a piece of literature in its own right. But I, I was, I've always wrestled with kind of what is, what essentially is story. I put a tweet out a few weeks ago asking people to kind of send some thoughts on that. And they, they, they inevitably they end up quite long. So a story begins when the main character has an idea, then seeks the idea on a journey, then adversities, allies, enemies, injuries, et cetera, ensue. And just when all seems tragically lost, the character recalls the idea and experiences an inner transformation leading them to safety. And I said, no, that's a plot. Right. Yeah. Someone else had a beginning, a journey, and ending. Again, I think that's a plot. Uh, so for me, boiling it down, it's actually much more like comedy. So I think it's at its most pure, it's a setup and a payoff. So a setup determines the conditions, and then a payoff is satisfying because if it's mm -hmm. done well, you feel something. And there's a gap between the expectation and result, and that for me is where where story is. It's literally setup and payoff, and so the craft of defining those two elements and mm -hmm. balancing them out and making them worthwhile is what story is about. And I think if you can break it down to something as simple as that, it gets very easy. But like everybody wraps story up in this huge kind of argument about, oh, it's this and it has to have this. No, it, it doesn't. Like a 10 second advert can be just as compelling as a piece of storytelling as a 90 minute film. But that's because it's great stories. Yeah. Yeah, that's I, I'm I'm with you. I think yeah, it's just the sto a story is an idea with a setup and a payoff, and we we you know with broadside we we definitely wrote a a story with a three act structure and seven set pieces, and it's like okay, this this is an action movie. This is this is what it looks like because this is a really compelling way to convey all the points we want to make about decentralization. But 
the setup really is phase one of broadside and the payoff is okay you own the rights to this character you know what you understand this world now go and do something crazy with this character we can't wait to see what people do yeah absolutely and it's i'm tracking youtube a lot at the moment because i'm kind of just obsessed with it and obsessed with particularly the mr beastification of youtube and mm -hmm. looking at how people have copied him and copied the spectacle creation engine but they yeah. suck at storytelling and they suck so bad it's kind of like if i shout really loud now we just keep this going it's like it's, it's like that it's like the you know it's like the horse racing you just can't take your eyes off it but like <laughs> nobody wants that there has to be nuance and there has to be light and shade and in those moments where you bring it down and suddenly you you know it's like the bass drops that's a piece of storytelling yeah. you know yeah it's it's oh my god it reminds me there's a, there's an snl sketch called when when will the bass drop and it's mm -hmm. like a dj and he just he's just there like this and it's andy sandberg just go like this and everyone and everyone in the audience is like ready for it and it never drops and it never drops and it never drops and then when it finally does drop everyone explodes it, that's <laughs> great. but it goes over like six minutes and it just doesn't stop it's very uh very david getter kind of yeah I love, I love that sketch it's good it's good so what are you guys excited about? Who's who's doing storytelling well? Or have you not had a chance to look beyond the borders of your own project recently? Yeah, we we have been very immersed in the project recently and especially in recent months. Um, but I, I actually hark, but I think it was you that um, opened my eyes to the level of storytelling that's currently being played out in Cyber Brokers. I know that you're, a lot, more, you're a lot more knowledgeable. <laughs> <laughs> you're a Cyber Brokers fanboy, I know. But, I do um, the podcast. I'm allowed. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I feel like they're probably hitting it most close to the mark recently. Um, what, what do you think? I'm biased. They have a decentralized <laughs> writers' room. They have. I mean, I know who's who's been helping them put that together, and it's like some of the most hardcore Hollywood like people around. That that they, they they do it right, and there's still a lot of, a, a long way for them to go. And I think Josie's still figuring out how the art, the mechanics, the gamification, and the quizzes like marry together. But yeah, it's rich. It's very, very rich. Mm. Yeah. And I don't know if you follow uh, Rick Galbraith as well on Twitter. He seems to be making a name for his, himself as the Web3 storyteller. He's got a few things going on under his belt. He's got uh, Tales of the Shroom, which seems to be my, one of his main ones. Have you seen that? I have Neil Rick Galbraith. Rick Galbraith. He's got a he's got a punk avatar. Always harping, punk avatar. always harping on about story on Twitter. Oh god, yeah, he's one. doing it really well. He's doing it really well. I got a big up. I mean, DC Comics in the back cows, what they're doing. Again, I'm part of that, so not to pump my own bags, but um, obviously they're very good at storytelling, and it's been a pleasure working with you know, a massive centralized company like Warner Brothers and having them be just very, very, very progressive about storytelling with NFTs. Um, it's just, you know, that see, being able to see something at completely other end spectrum from broadside as well. I, I think, I think Web3 is going to continue to go in both directions, but the, yeah, the storytelling piece is important across the spectrum. Yeah, interesting. I did not know Rick Galbraith, and now I see it. I'm like, oh no, there's someone else harping on about story. I'm obsessed with story. Yeah, it, it's yeah. like you know these these primal building blocks of how we we make something that should be boring, yeah. delightful. Just obsessed. Yeah, he he started. He made his name with the Punks comic. I don't know if you ever got one of those. It was yeah, one of, uh, yeah, that was one of his first ones yeah well yeah definitely i'm i'm i mean personally i'm very very excited about the future of this space because i just see the caliber of people that have come in it's not like shit coins like you, it's very hard for me to judge the the value of a of an ethereum developer because i have no frame of reference for it but in the creative space like i when i look at it i'm like whoa this is this is dope like genuinely dope um there's a project called mv3 and one of the showrunners from Stranger Things is running that. And we had her on Jesse Dixon Lopez, Nixon Lopez. She's awesome. Like, this is someone who's like busted 
through the glass ceiling in Hollywood and actually experience all of that, run writers' rooms, has our own show with Apple. It's like, oh my God, you're you're in this space working here. Like what a yeah. privilege, you know, to be for us to be kind of that close to people of that caliber. It's really awesome. Wow. Yeah. I just can't wait for I want I, the more creative people understand understanding that blockchain is a creative medium, the better. Because that's the thing that I think's been I've been so hyped on with Web3 is it's just like we've never had tools like this before for telling stories and they're better and different than anything we've had before. And people, that that narrative hasn't broken through yet. Yeah, I, I get a chance to speak to some some Hollywood folks from time to time and they're all like, this, this, my friends, this is it. And I, who was I speaking to? Some, I can't actually name him because uh, it'll get into me in trouble. He's like, he said, my opposition is Hollywood is fucked. They don't realize how badly fucked they are right now. But some of them are trying to unfuck themselves. And if you've ever tried to unfuck yourself, you will discover that it's actually quite difficult. Um, so that is where Hollywood is, is, is at, at the moment. And I mean, you can feel it, right? There are these waves of things that are successful. And then that success gets mined mm -hmm. until there's nothing left. And the Avengers model, the Marvel model, whatever it is, I mean, that's been done now. Something else is going to succeed it because we've peaked on Marvel, surely. Well, um, you'd you know. think so. I, but I, th I think this is one of the the real tension points that we discovered, both me and Matt actually separately in some ways and together, but the, the Hollywood machine and essentially pitching IP through their existing avenues is not only quite time consuming and very slow moving, um, but it's also like you, you it's, it's a bit like death by a thousand cuts. You, you yeah. really have to mold your ideas to different things as you go. And, and that morphs and that changes. If, you know, this is the journey we were doing in very uh, oh, as aggressively as you can in the slow moving industry. But if for the first two years before NFTs, uh, I was very focused on that. And I just kind of got to a place with it whereby it felt like I was constantly had a begging bowl and I was asking for. Uh, money for to make ideas and it just felt like you know I got I felt like I got really far like uh you know in terms of you know, making some movements but as, when I got to a certain place I was like I haven't even got anywhere I'm actually at the start mm. and I'm not even that much near the start this is going to be a decade-long process of and by then so many things can change so you know it, it just feels difficult especially with all the the big IP, you know, like it's hard to get good slots because it's just dominated by all the big franchises. So it, it felt like something had to change. And that and that was a big moment for me and Matt when we'd we'd kind of had enough of those roots independently and NFTs came around and something clicked. And we were just like, wait, this this is the next generation of, mm. of how you get stories and intellectual property off the ground because the old system is very much broken in some ways. Um, yeah. So yeah, it's you know that was a big thing. That was a big thing that changed our perception and, and set us on this journey. And I hope that more people can kind of come around to that and realize that and realize how powerful a shift it is that's happening. Just think about it for a second, like the stats that you can get now, like on on NFTs. Like NFTs are dead, right? It's crypto winter. Where it's all dead. It's all done. Everybody's down bad. If you go and try and do a stream on Twitch, you have to grind and grind and grind to get three concurrent viewers. If you want to do, if you want to do a book deal, which is much easier than selling a screenplay, you've got like a one in a hundred thousand or a million chance, and the average American buys less than one book a year, and that number's drop dropping, and three million books come out a year or something. Sixty thousand songs come out every day on Spotify. 30,000 apps hit the app store every month. If you want to launch an app, you have to go and spend four or five bucks to get a user. You have to do all this stuff. If you launch an NFT project right now, when crypto is dead and it's all down bad and terrible, you will get people mobbing you to get on the allow list so they can buy your thing, so they can be part of your journey. If you start a Twitter space about that project, you'll get 80 to 100 to 1,000 people in there, depending on your project. Like people keep talking about how bad things are in Web3. It's better than any other any other ecosystem that was used for promoting culture than I've ever been in as a creator 
in 20 years, right now when it's at its absolute fucking worst, it's still the best thing I've ever seen. Like, this is the tool for scaling culture from naught to 60. Like Lex said, so you don't have to go with the begging bowl and ask for someone's permission and get notes because all of that stuff gets in the way of telling your story. And if you get to tell your story and it connects with people, then you don't go with the begging bowl. You go and you say, this is the story. Look at this army I've got. And we're going to do things the way that we're going to do them to tell the story properly. And people listen to you. And that's the whole thing for me, like the scaling pirate culture. That's what it means is getting creators from naught to 60. And if we do nothing else with Broadside, I hope we just get to show people this is another way to try and tell, tell a story and see if it can work. Yeah, there's a lot of gatekeepers in trying to get traditional things made. And so you, you go through this dance where somebody will tell you that they can get access to this actor. And getting talent attached is this thing. And then you've got them for like a year and then they, they get on another project and they wash out and suddenly you're back to, to zero again. And then suddenly the landscape's changed and horror movies are not hot anymore. And then this mm -hmm. has changed. And suddenly this actor has changed the game and they're just over here. And like you're going, would... <laughs> We, we were, we, and then you're like, oh, we'd love to do a general meeting with you. Like the general mm -hmm. meeting, if you don't know, you turn up, you have a meeting. They say a lot of very nice things about you. You never hear from them again. And mm -hmm. you go to lots of these in Hollywood and they are soul destroying, but they basically just, at some point, something might click. Web3 doesn't do that. A lot, and Web3 gets a lot of shit for scams. A lot of ideas get spun up. A lot of shitty ideas get spun up, get invested in, get turned into something and collapse. But I tell you what, if Hollywood operated on the same system where things got spun up and failed rapidly, they would get to a place where more risks were taken and more interesting things got made because outliers would slip through. Whereas where, what we have now is like the safe bets mm -hmm. and they're not even that safe because nothing in Hollywood is safe. Those are the ones that get invested in. Whereas what we have now is a system where shit projects fail really fast. And so mm -hmm. good projects don't have to fight against them because people just move on and they get burned and they, they learn. And like the, the, the education, the, the speed at which people learn and start to self-select is incredible. And so yeah. I'm really thankful for that because even in the shittiest projects, there might actually be something really good and someone will steal it because that's what we do and then fork it and turn it into something else. So just being exposed to all that and seeing stuff fail and live and die and, and talent pop up and talent be attracted that's why this space is exciting because yeah. it just draws people out of the woodwork into a shared experience of like, we don't know what the fuck's going on, but it's better than anything else. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Yeah. And it, it's, it was also quite, uh, it's, it's definitely a better system in those ways. Obviously there is the element of people just hijacking the format of the generative drop and just not really developing it. And then that's obviously where attention goes away eventually. But in some ways that, that format still has a lot of value if you compare that to the old Hollywood uh, pitching format or even just going around to broadcasters, like bro uh, common feedback from broadcasters in these kind of general meetings that you might have, which I almost feel is like a, a, a fob off piece of feedback. But they will often say, well, if you go away and you develop financing and you develop an audience, then we can re-review the idea. But, you know, back in the day, how would you how would you realistically do that? It, you could maybe through social media. But for, for a new piece of IP to develop some kind of social media interest and then also then develop financing is near impossible, like quite difficult. But now, you know, the system we have now, you can you can do that. You can rapid prototype, you can rapid uh, build an audience and you uh, you have a, a, a way to build funding. So, again, contrasting it to the old systems it still looks a lot brighter and it still looks uh, a lot more exciting. And, and it kind of combats all these old systems, these old dead ends that you used to find yourself in. Yeah, we, we've been there. And it's, it's hard to explain to kids who, who, who've who grown up on YouTube, just able to do whatever the fuck they want mm. and building audiences on TikTok, like what the trad grind of this shit is. Because like, even just to get to a point where like the camera you can shoot on, for instance, from my world, was good enough to make you look like you kind of knew what you were doing. Well, that was a journey in itself. Now you just, you know, an iPhone was good enough. Crazy. And I'm not complaining about that because I learned a lot grinding my way up. But it's also, it, it, yeah, there's, there's a certain kind of level of just experience that I think a lot of young projects just don't have. And then they don't, you know, we're creative. No, you're not.
No, you're not. You just copied someone and then got an artist. That's not creative. Show me what creativity is, and, and then we can talk. I'm I'm ranting. I've got an explosion. Do an explosion. I don't have an explosion. I, I, I gave my stream deck away to someone else, so all I've got is... <laughs> oh, that's good. That's good. Though. All right. Oh, I got a drum beat. This is like a Victor Meldrew set. <laughs> similar, similar. You have to come to our next allow list rave. Oh yeah, sure. I'll, be, I'll be right <laughs> there. <laughs> <laughs> I love you. <laughs> Don't talk dirty to me. I can hear what you say. Oh, that's my new beat. beat. I'm just making beats now. That was it. <laughs> <laughs> that's how easy it is. Uh, listen, gents, this has been an absolute pleasure. Um, final thing is, I think the folks out there who've been spamming us with, with Batman <laughs> emojis. I told you the Bat Cows crew, man. Big up I, the Bat Cows. The skulls. And the skulls. The skulls as and well. The skulls, the skulls, are, the skulls. skulls are broadside skulls. This has the been skulls are all broadside. Down. This has been hands down the best stream we have ever done for audience engagement. I've just been having a blast <laughs> really going through these. But I'm sure I'm sure these 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 folks uh, are desperate to know when broadside. It's a good Soon. question. Soon. Oh, for God's <laughs> sake! You don't have Listen, a date. The tradition of all the back house fan will appreciate this. Soon. Oh. Soon. All right. Well, you've been working on it for 10 years. So what's another couple of months? I mean, we're oh, thinking. Yeah. No, it won't even be a couple of months. It won't be a couple of months. Yeah. Awesome. Um, just, just just be ready. Tell them to be okay. ready. Follow Broadside okay. NFT on Twitter. Follow Broadside NFT. Are you, have you guys got a TG or a, a Discord or anything yet? No. We're, we're actually, we're, we, yeah, we're not we're not too sure about Discord just yet. We, we, we want to roll out a story through Twitter and that be a, a, a kind of narrative touch point. Edgy, so, uh, I know. Pirate radio. Yeah, we're part radio style. We're running part radio sessions over Twitter, and that's our main focus for the time being. But we're also going to be very active in talking for the rest of today on different Twitter spaces from the next few hours. So if people got more questions, we can answer them later. So I've, I've just been fiddly with, I just discovered this background music in StreamYard, and I was just like, oh, I thought you were now. playing us off. I thought you were playing Vector off. Yeah. Oh, no, I wasn't. No, I was just. <laughs> yeah. I, it's some clown music and a, a walking stick comes out. <laughs> well, we, we can do better than that. I wish there was a way to introduce like your own. Oh, you can have you can add your own music. Well, that's great. Um, well, so where are the Twitter spaces going to be? So just follow Broadside NFT, yeah. Broadside NFT. No, oh, it's so exciting. This is good shit. Um, well, guys, I wish you the best of luck, and we should definitely have you on for some kind of pirate thing. War. <laughs> Oh, there. he went there. He went there. <laughs> uh, but yeah, very best of luck. Uh, this was uh, Matt and Vector Melju from Broadside. We don't know when it's going to be dropping, but it will be dropping soon and it'll be a blast when it does. Thanks very much for joining us, guys. I wish you the very best of luck with all of it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bones up. Uh, Bones up. Bones up. With that, it's time <laughs> to end. <laughs>